started. Um, hello, welcome everyone to our webinar hosted by the Collaborative Conservation and Adaptation Strategy Toolbox, or CCAST. My name is Christy Miner. I am the Non-Native Aquatic Species Community Practice Coordinator for CCAST. And for anyone unfamiliar, CCAST is a platform for peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange and co-production of decision support tools on key management challenges such as introduced aquatic species. CCAS supports a few different communities of practice, including this non-native aquatic species community practice that we launched in May of 2020. If anyone would like any more information on CCAST or on the community of practice, uh, you can email me or Matt Graybaugh, and um, we'll have those emails into the chat here in just a minute. Webinars uh, like today's are one way that we facilitate peer-to-peer -peer knowledge exchange. And today we're very excited to host a presentation from Jeff Jennis, who will discuss bullfrogs of the Williams Ranger District. Jeff is a GIS analyst for the Spring Stewardship Institute, adjunct professor of GIS at the School of Forestry at Northern Arizona University, chair of the Spatial Ecology and Telemetry Working Group of the Wildlife Society, and an independent consultant specializing in developing analytical applications for a wide variety of topics. Since starting his consulting business in 2000, he was working with, or has worked with universities, businesses, and government agencies all around the world. Just a final reminder before I turn it over to Jeff, um, if you have questions, please feel free to enter those into the chat box as we go along, and I will relay them to our speaker after the presentation. And with that, um, Jeff, I will hand it over to you. Thanks, Christy. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, Thank you for attending this presentation. Uh, as Christy said, my name is Jeff Janess, and I'm going to discuss some work that Audrey Owens, uh, Susie McVean, and I have been doing to identify water sites on the Williams Ranger District, where Arizona Game and Fish Department might have the best chance of successfully removing bullfrogs, and where likely sites might be to reintroduce leopard frogs. Now, <clears throat> just a sec. Now, this is a little bit of a work in progress right now. Uh, we've done a preliminary analysis using several data sets that I'm going to discuss shortly, but the Arizona Game and Fish Department and Kaibab National Forest have been gathering more data since we've done this, and so we're going to incorporate that new data in the next few months. Also, this discussion only covers the initial GIS analysis. I'm not going to discuss any actual efforts to go out and remove bullfrogs because we really aren't at that point yet. But if any of you have thoughts on how we can improve this part of the analysis, we would certainly welcome your ideas. Okay, now we had five steps in our basic strategy, and I'm going to go into each of these in more detail. But our first step was to combine eight different data sets of water site locations and survey data into a single point data set. Second, we identified which of these sites had bullfrogs, and this was more challenging than it sounds because each data set reported this information differently. Next, we calculated several statistics that we thought would contribute to successfully eradicating bullfrogs and to successfully reintroducing northern leopard frogs. And most of these statistics were some variation on isolation, either from other water sites or from other bullfrog locations, and I'm going to describe them in more detail shortly. Then we assigned ranks to each site based on their various isolation values. We summed up the ranks. Sites with the lowest cumulative ranks would be the most promising for bullfrog eradication. And finally, we generated a set of web maps to share these results with the public. And this last step mostly entailed figuring out aesthetic and informative ways to display the final data. All right, so going into a bit more detail, we started with eight data sets describing water sites and bullfrog surveys in and around the Williams Ranger District. Now, these water sites could include springs, ponds, and stock tanks, and four of these were provided by the Arizona Game and Fish Department. We had three data sets from the Kaibab National Forest and one from the Spring Stewardship Institute. And the data set from the Spring Stewardship Institute came from Springs Online, and it included survey data from 19 different research projects conducted by several people, including the Spring Stewardship Institute, the Forest Service, City of Flagstaff, and NAU. Now, these data sets cover different general extents and contain different types of data. And for example, the Arizona Game and Fish surveys from 2021 were concentrated in the southwest portion of of the, the Williams Ranger District and contained information on fish species observed at each site. 
while the Arizona Game and Fish Herp database was well distributed throughout the southern half of the Ranger District and included information on bullfrogs and crayfish, tiger salamanders, non-native fish, and whether a site had potential for northern leopard frog populations. And actually, several of our data sets included information on whether crayfish and tiger salamanders, non-native fish, were observed at that site. So we took advantage of that to map the spatial distribution of these other species along with bullfrogs. And I show you some of those at the end of the presentation as well. <clears throat> uh, but moving on with source data sets, we had a survey of sport fishing tanks from the Arizona Game and Fish Department, included information on bullfrogs and crayfish, tiger salamanders, non-native fish. We had a data set of general water locations in the upper Verde watershed. These sites had no information on species that were at the sites, but they extended far outside the Williams Ranger District and they allowed us to, to use locations to help analyze how isolated our bullfrog sites were from other water sites. Those are the four data sets from the Arizona Game of Fish. From the Kaibab National Forest, we had a, a set of 26 sites from the Kaibab wildlife biologist, Roger Juice, that he had surveyed back in 2009. These sites were all in the upper portions of the drainage system leading into Sycamore Canyon. Kaibab also provided some environmental DNA analysis from the southwestern, or excuse me, the southeastern portion of the Ranger District. They had results that showed evidence of bullfrogs and crayfish, as well as ranavirus and chytrid fungi. And interestingly, with the eDNA stuff, one of the sites found no evidence of bullfrog DNA, but bullfrogs were observed visually at the site when it was sampled. And there are also three cases where bullfrogs have been observed in recent years, but not detected visually in, in the survey when they were doing the eDNA data collection. Now, the last data set from the Kaibab was this large set of bullfrog surveys from 2017, 2020, and 2021. These sites were well distributed throughout the Ranger District. And while conducting these surveys, surveys also mentioned whether they had observed tiger salamanders and non-native fish at the sites. And finally, the Spring Stewardship Institute supplied survey data for all springs within 15 miles of the Williams Ranger District. And their surveys included uh, observations of bullfrog, crayfish, tiger salamanders, non-native fish, and northern leopard frogs, as well as general surveys of all vertebrates, inverts, and flora species observed at each spring. <clears throat> okay, so our source data sets from the Arizona uh, game fish and from the Forest Service came in the form of Excel spreadsheets. And so first we had to convert these point data sets so that we could uh, analyze them in GIS. And, and, and as I'm sure is no surprise to anyone who's ever tried to combine survey data sets gathered by different people at different times for different purposes, this step got a little tricky. The spatial difficulties were that the data came in multiple projections, specifically UTM Zone 12 and Web Mercator. Data came in multiple datums, including North American datums of 1927, 1983, plus World Geodetic Survey of 1984. And sometimes a single data set would con contain records from multiple datums. And to, that's just meant that to get the data converted accurately, we just had to be careful. We used a lot of custom code to examine each record individually to decide how to import it. And at the end of the day, all final data sets were uh, produced in WGS 1984 web Mercator coordinates. And we only chose this coordinate system because it's the standard coordinate system for online web mapping applications. We wanted to provide these data to the general public via web maps. So we just put it in web Mercator. Otherwise, web Mercator is not really a great coordinate system for calculating distances and areas. But once we had converted the eight data sets into points, we next had to decide which points needed to be combined because they all referred to the same actual site on the ground. So all sites had location information, but they rarely had the same coordinates for the same actual site on the landscape. And our strategy here was to first identify spatially clustered points from all the data sets with the assumption that a cluster of locations from multiple data sets probably means that all locations refer to the same actual feature on the ground. Therefore, we could generate a single site from that cluster of points. So for example, these four locations all had the same name and were spatially clustered. So it was easy to combine them into a single representative site that we named Sunflower Flat. But in other cases, uh, these sites clearly represented the same location on the ground, which was visible in the imagery, but they had three different site names. 
uh, these sites represented the same location on the ground because they were reasonably close to each other and all had the same name, but one site was a definite outlier spatially. And I wouldn't be surprised if it was just some data entry error when typing in the coordinates. And of course, that kind of thing is not unusual. Now, after a close examination of the data uh, and looking at all these clusters, we settled on a threshold separation distance of 141 meters. And this meant that we defined a cluster as a spatially clustered group of locations in which each location was at most 141 meters from at least one other member of the cluster. We then took that mean spatial location of all members of the cluster as the representative location for the site. And of course, after settling on this threshold distance, we naturally found numerous exceptions to the rule in which locations might be closer than 141 meters from a neighbor and yet still truly represent a distinct site. So just normal data, data, data issues you deal with. And in this example, we found 10 locations which could have spatially been combined, but based on the comments and examination of the data, we decided they should be split into three representative sites found numerous special cases in the other direction where points were greater than 141 meters from the nearest neighbor, but we still thought they ought to be merged into a single site, such as these surveys for Whitehorse Lake. And in general, we manually merged or split these special cases as appropriate. And upon completion, we wound up, we had, we, well, we merged 647 original point locations from the original eight data sets into a single feature class containing 482 representative water sites on or near the Williams Ranger District. Um, okay. The final geodatabase we're making available to the public actually includes the combined set of representative sites as a single point feature class. And we also have relationship classes that link those representative sites to the source data. So you can just click on the site and you can quickly review all the source information that, that produced that representative site. Okay, so now we had a final set of water sites to work with. So we just needed to identify which sites had bullfrogs. And problem here again should be familiar to anyone who's ever tried to pull data from multiple data sets in multiple formats. All the information we needed was there, but each data set presented it differently. Some data sets had attributes specifically stating whether bullfrogs had been found, while other data sets just included that information in descriptive comments. Spring Stewardship Institute data was it, they didn't have species observations at all in the point features themselves, but rather in a in connected related tables, so you'd uh, query down through the relationship classes. So again, it just required careful coding to analyze each record to see if it indicated that bullfrogs were present, and each data set had to be analyzed in its own way. And in total, we found 61 sites on or near the Williams Ranger District that had recorded bullfrogs. And these were mostly concentrated in the southeastern portion of the Ranger District. We also recorded some information about the describing our clustering process, some information on how many years bullfrogs have been observed, and when the most recent observation occurred. And we put all that in the representative point feature class. And as I mentioned before, these data sets often mentioned other species of interest, such as crayfish, tiger salamanders, non-native fish, and northern leopard frogs. So while we're at it, we also map the distributions of these species. And we found 18 sites with northern leopard frogs recorded, 14 sites with crayfish, 11 sites with tiger salamanders, and 44 sites with non-native fish. Right, this brings us to step three calculating data about each site that would help us decide which sites might give us the best chance for successfully eradicating bullfrogs. And we considered several factors that we thought might be good predictors for this. And these are mostly based on various types of isolation. Most important, we wanted sites that were isolated from other bullfrogs. We felt that sites that were near other sites containing bullfrogs would probably be poor candidates for eradication because it would be easier for bullfrogs to recolonize a site. If, you know, if they're just close by. But there are multiple ways that we can measure this. So for each water site on the Bull, on the Williams Ranger District, we calculated first the Euclidean distance. That just means a straight line as the crow flies distance to the nearest site with bullfrogs. Now, since bullfrogs can cross a certain amount of open ground, this straight line distance should give a good indication of the likelihood of reintroduction. But more than just a single nearest site, we felt that 
if there were multiple sites nearby, that would also pose a threat to bullfrog reintroduction, and therefore we calculated the average distance to the three nearest sites. Bullfrog density also gets at this concept of multiple nearby sites, so we calculated this as well. And we calculated the, the kernel density using a five-mile neighborhood around each, each point. And then we mapped this, this general bullfrog density as, as a web map across the Williams Ranger District, and this is part of our, our public web maps that we're providing. And while it's true that bullfrogs can cross open ground, we felt that travel through the hydrologic network might be easier and more likely for them, especially during monsoon season. So we also calculated the distance to the nearest bullfrog sites when travel paths were constrained to water flow paths. So for example, uh, Oak Tank and Station Tank here both have bullfrogs. These are only 12 kilometers apart in a straight line, but they're 138 kilometers through the hydrologic network. And just to mention from a GIS perspective, because I love GIS, these distances through the hydrologic network were really a lot of fun to calculate. It's kind of GIS at its most entertaining. And we couldn't find any existing tools that would easily calculate all distances from all pairs of points. So we wrote our own networking algorithms to do it. It was also interesting to see how disconnected some of the watersheds on the Williams Ranger District were from each other. Some drain into the Little Colorado, some straight north into Cataract Creek and into the Grand Canyon, some go south into the Verde River. And for a lot of these, the only point where they actually meet is down in Yuma. And finally, using the same logic we used above, we also calculated the average distance to the three near sites with bullfrogs. Uh, looks like I skipped my slide there. Sorry about that. Um, and and so so this was when the travel paths were constrained to to water flow paths. All right. So at the end, we had five measures that describe proximity to other sites with bullfrogs, but we also felt that isolation from other water sources might be a useful thing to know as well. So if a site is a long way from anywhere that could even possibly be colonized by, by bullfrogs, then it's just one added level of protection. So we used a similar strategy to calculate proximity to other water sites as we did proximity to other bullfrog sites. So we calculated Euclidean distance to the three nearest water sites through the hydrologic network. We calculated the distance through the hydrologic network to the nearest, nearest water site. Uh, let's see. Uh, we and we also calculated the distance to the the three nearest sites, you know, both Euclidean and through the hydrologic network. All right. So now we had four measures that describe proximity to water, and five measures that describe proximity to other bullfrog sites. And there was one more factor we thought might be important from a management perspective, and that would be that private landowners might not be as concerned about bullfrog pres uh, presence as Arizona Game and Fish and other state and federal agencies. These, these agencies might have little authority to manage bullfrogs on these private lands. So the presence of private land therefore introduces a factor that Game and Fish can't control for. So I felt that sites far from public lands would be a better bet than sites near public, near far from private lands, excuse me, would be a better bet than sites near private lands. So there's a fair amount of private land in the area, including within the boundaries of the Williams Ranger District. And you know, using this logic, really the, the only private land that would be of concern would be those that contained water sites. So we calculated the Euclidean distance to all those private lands that contained water sites. All right. Now takes us to step four. Now we had to generate a cumulative score for each site that contained the bullfrogs. So at this point, we had five measures that describe proximity to bullfrogs, four measures that describe proximity to water, and one measure describing proximity to private lands that contain water. Now, all these proximity values were in meters, but we felt it would be more useful to calculate final scores based on ranks instead of absolute values. Therefore, we ranked our bullfrog sites on each of these 10 measures. Now, low, low ranks were best, and therefore we, we ranked sites with the greatest distance values with the lowest rank values. So, for example, the bullfrog site that was furthest from other any other bullfrog site would get a rank value of 1 with respect to the the uh, measure Euclidean distance to other bullfrog sites. 
Now, at this point, we had 10 rank scores for each of our bullfrog sites, and our final calculation was just adding up these to get a cumulative rank score. Sites with the lowest cumulative rank score would likely be the best candidates for successful bullfrog removal. And it's a pretty simple strategy and one that's easy to modify if we decide to exclude any measures or even add weights to them. Right now, since we're just adding the ranks up, we're essentially treating all 10 measures as equally important, and that might be a debatable assumption, but it's a reasonable first shot, I think. And, and so at, at the end, we can see in this map that the best candidates uh, for potential eradication based on those ranks would be those these two, two, uh, you know, these two uh, sites down at the southern edge of the Williams Ranger District. We also have one up here that's a pretty good candidate. Now, you always wonder if sites at the edge of your analysis area really reflect good information because you know it's it's the inside of the analysis area that got the most survey effort. But these still might be good options down here. All right, now, this, yeah, okay, so. As I said, we've recently received more data from Arizona Game and Fish, and Kaibab might have more surveys done available as well. So we plan to redo this analysis with the full data set in the next few months. And we'd certainly appreciate it if you'd let us know if you spotted any major problems in our strategy. <clears throat> now, finally, last step. We, we wanted to share the data with the, uh, with the public in some you know, user-friendly way. Now, Esri has a whole family of these what they call you know some variations on story maps and we we went with one that we're calling that they call the web experience we've we've got these three and i, I guess a, a temporary version of these i'm just going to paste them into the chat if anybody wants to take a look and i'm going to link to them in just a moment let's see all right there they are in the chat uh, Okay. All right, so here's one of them. Uh, I'm assuming everybody can see this okay. This is the, 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 uh, the bullfrog sites ranked by the likelihood of, of successful eradication based on, the, based on those ranking scores. So it's a web map, you can zoom into it, you can examine different things. It has a legend that explains the symbology that you see. It has uh, layers that you can turn on and off. So if, if, if something is distracting us, maybe we don't want to see the private lands. Uh, maybe we don't want to see the drainage network right now. We can just see the sites. We can zoom in and take a look at, as you zoom in close enough, these things take on names. And then if you want to click on them, you can get extra information. And this, this was kind of fun. Uh, uh, Esri has this new language that they're really proud of called Arcade, and this it's it's designed for constructing. Uh, well, it does a lot of things, but we used it for generating a report on the site based on the attribute values. So this is all constructed on the fly. There's a whole bunch of information about the bullfrogs. It tells you the ranking of this particular site based on the cumulative rank. So. Uh, rocky Elo Spring Lower is probably not the first place we want to spend our resources trying to remove bullfrogs because uh, it just ranks so poorly in all the scales. Gives lots of information on uh, nearest near sites with bullfrogs. If there's a photograph available, it'll show you that. It even figures out who took the photograph and when it was taken and constructs a citation. A lot of information just about the site itself, elevation and location, uh, distance to other water sites. Generates little summary reports on the other species of interest like leopard frogs, crayfish, tiger salamanders, and non-native fish species. And finally, it tells you which source, source data sets produce the information we have for this final site. So I think this is a pretty friendly thing for to share with the public and helps uh, you know helps people visualize what we have in mind we have three web maps here we uh, this is the bullfrog densities so we can see bullfrog locations plus the density heat map we generated and the uh, the species of interest lets us look at all of those species that we were I was discussing this is one where we might turn off layers I'm, I'm going to turn these off real quick and I can say 
only if I'm just curious where the crayfish are, I can turn off everything but crayfish. So I can see crayfish. I can I can jump over to bullfrog locations. I can see the leopard frog locations. So all this is available right within the web map where it's handy and, and easy to get to. All right. Uh, and you now these will these will be updated, right? Uh, right now, they're not actually on the Arizona Game and Fish web server because we're still going to do some more analysis. But once we get the next round of analysis done, we'll, we'll pop this over there. And that brings me to my final slide. So uh, uh, thank you all so much for listening. Also, just want to thank all those people who, who did all that work collecting the field data. And I want to thank Game and Fish, the Kaibab, and Spring Stewardship Institute for sharing this data. And uh, I'm ready to hear comments and questions. Thank you so much, Jeff. That was awesome and really, really exciting to see oh, all the work you. that you've done. <laughs> Um, do we have any questions? We haven't had any come through the chat just yet, um, but feel free to throw those into the chat or raise your, your Zoom hand and we can call on you that way as well. Thanks, Marina, for the comment on the maps. I think everything's better with a map, isn't it? <laughs> I'd be happy to share the presentation, Christy. The uh, would you would you like me to provide a, a PowerPoint? Well, you're going to have a recording of it. Yeah, so we will put the recording up on YouTube, um, our YouTube channel, and we will drop that link um, in the chat here shortly. Um, and so, if that works for you, um, that'll be available. If not. Um, I'll let you reach out to Jeff individually and decide if you want the actual PowerPoint itself. Yeah, you're more than welcome to it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, yeah. Susie. <laughs> yeah, and for, I see a lot of new folks here. Um, for those interested, we have on our YouTube channel, um, which we'll throw in the chat here in just a minute. Um, we have all of our previous webinars too, and we have a lot on bullfrogs, if that's something people are interested in. Um, we're also doing, through the community of practice, a lot of work on bullfrog control tools um, that is really interesting and that folks on this project that you heard about today are working on. So feel free to, um, to reach out if you want more, any more information on the community practice and the work that we do um, or any of our previous webinars or products that we're working on. Just wanted to throw that out there in the meantime. Mm -hmm. And thanks, Carly, for dropping those links in the chat there. It looks like Leland Pierce has a question. Uh, how often will these be updated? Fires and post-fire flooding can rework hydrologic networks, potentially cutting off or creating access for bullfrog movement. Uh, good question. You know, for Actually, the hydrologic network I used was purely topographic. Uh, it, it was you know, generated straight from flow direction and everything. And uh, I, I'm, we're going to redo this. You know, there, you know, there's only a limited budget for it. Um, so, you know, once we get this next round, I, I don't know. We just have to talk to Game and Fish about that, I guess. But it would be kind of interesting to put in blocks in the network. If, uh, if, if, if we think that bullfrogs can't traverse a particular area, it would be uh, easy to implement that and kind of fun from the GIS end. Yeah, I, I guess I just enjoy that. Uh, and uh, Clarissa, uh, apologies if, if I miss this, but how is eDNA collected? This would be a question for the the our, my my colleagues Audrey and Susie. They they might have a because I wasn't there when 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 they did that. Yeah, actually, I think Olivia is on the call, and, and Olivia was the one who um, did the eDNA collection. Olivia, do you want to talk about that? Did the eDNA collection? Olivia, do you want to talk about that? <laughs> 
Yeah, hi. Um, just trying to get my video turned on. My computer is being a little slow. <laughs> um, we did collect 20 sites of eDNA data last year. Can everybody hear me all right? Yep. Yep, sounds good. Yep. Okay, just checking. Um, yeah, we collected eDNA samples at, at 20 sites last year and at 20 more sites this year. This year but we did um, change the protocol a bit um, because the original protocol was for Lentic systems, non-flowing systems. So they modified uh, the protocol uh, for flow or for Lentic systems. Um, and so basically you go around the pond or the tank and you collect, um, I, I wanna say it's like 50, you collect a certain amount of water from 10 points around the entire pond, and then it gets filtered um, through a pump and you have these little circle filters and uh, you end up sending, if you can get five liters out of the sample, uh, that's good. But because our waters aren't flowing, usually um, it's harder for us to get that much of a sample. So they're usually smaller than five liters uh, coming from the Williams Ranger District. Um, but then we send them in um, and they're analyzed for uh, bullfrog DNA and other species and things like that. Um, yeah, hopefully I answered the question fully. Okay, thanks. So thanks. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've got um, lots of questions rolling in now, which is great. <laughs> yeah. and. <clears throat> It looks like a lot of these are, are going to be really appropriate for my colleagues. Uh, but I, I do, for starting with John Crafts, uh, was site complexity or size accounted for? Some sites can be more difficult to remove bullfrogs than others. And boy, I think that's a terrific point. No, it was not. And uh, we don't right offhand have a, have a, a, a measure of site complexity or size for these sites. I think to have that would definitely add to, to the, would make this a better analysis. Um, if, if Audrey or Susie has any thoughts on, on how, we, how we could get measures of that, that, that would be great. Yeah, um, right off the bat, I don't have any ideas for, um, for, complexity, um, the size would be easy. Um, and I think the next question is kind of related to this, but um, if, if there was a way that we could um, weight the, the ranks of the bullfrog sites um, to account for size or the fact that, you know, some sites are gonna be source populations where breeding is occurring and frogs are actively dispersing from, whereas others are going to be sites that um, bullfrogs disperse to, but maybe they don't breed there for whatever reason. So having that information on the bullfrog source sites will be, um, I think, a really important dimension to um, the spatial data. Thanks, Audrey. Do you, do you want to uh, take a look at Bernie's question as well after that? Because, like you said, it's related. Yeah. Um, so, um, sites that are, let's see. Sorry, let me put my glasses on. <laughs> I can read it too if, if that would make it easier. I, I've got it now. Okay. Um, if a pond is easy to eradicate, but not really isolated, it may be a better option than one that is really isolated but really expensive to eradicate. Yeah, seems like a good point. You know, with a limited budget, we got to allocate our resources to what's most likely to be successful. Right, yeah, but I, I don't know. Um, I don't know, it, higher or greater, higher chance of success mm -hmm. um, might mean that you have to put more resources into it. Um, mm -hmm you know, over a longer period of time, but isolation is a really important factor um, because yeah, yeah. then, because the monitoring part of, um, of bullfrog control is, is important and 
um, it's harder to get the funding and the resources for the longer term monitoring. Um, so, you know, there is an argument for a site, um, the isolation being more important. Um, but I guess it just, it kind of depends on, on looking at the landscape. And, and that's why like what we have here is, um, is it, it's awesome. It's a little overwhelming because, you know, um, there's, this is basically as, as close as you can get to like, you know, putting in data and then getting an answer. Um, mm -hmm. But it's never going to be as easy as that because then you have to like peel all these layers back and, and, you know, see that there's other non-natives that could be a factor and, um, and yeah, looking into like if, if a site is a source population for bullfrogs or not. Um, but definitely like when Susie and I first looked at this, at these maps, we were, I mean, just so excited because right off the bat, we saw sites that could be potentially viable for Northern leopard frog introductions um, that we hadn't considered um, until we saw it on the map, so. Yeah, and this is Susie. I, I was just going to add that, you know, this is just a tool to help us narrow down uh, locations where we should attempt bullfrog eradication slash northern leopard frog reintroduction. But clearly, you're going to have to do a bunch of field recon. And, you know, these are local sites for us. And um, those of us that would be doing the work. Uh, are familiar with the area and and can get to those sites pretty easily. And so, you know, it's always going to come down to going out there and, and realizing, oh my gosh, this is going to be too hard, even though it's ranked really high. Um, and, you know, so you can't answer every question <laughs> with this model, of course, it, but it's, it's huge, huge towards, um, narrowing it down and like Audrey said we've already identified sites that we think we we need to get on you know right away hopefully next field season we'll be able to implement begin implementation of um of this tool but yeah it's just a decision tool basically so anyhow that's it <laughs> Bernie, Bernie also had a question about the consensus on bullfrog dispersal distances, and sounds like uh, we have some folks in the crowd who also have ideas on that. Bradford points out that a five-mile circle is easily traversed by adults, and especially in rains. Uh, I, I think that that is a good question, Did, and I don't know the answer personally. Uh, and, you know, we we went with a five-mile radius as just sort of a, a and it, it seemed reasonable and, and just something to start with. But yeah, if other people have good evidence that, that they travel more, that would be useful to know. Yeah, five miles is what um, we have used for buffer zones in southern Arizona. Um, and it's um, obviously it's not always black and white like that. But. Right. Okay. John asks, was this helpful in identifying sites where no removal would be necessary and native frogs could be established right away? And Olivia, or, I'm sorry, Audrey, I think that you kind of addressed that. You, yeah. You said, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Susie and I both um, talked about that. That there was a list of sites that um, that you know need to be ground truth because they look good right off the bat. Okay. Cool. Annie, uh, we did something similar for sites in Baja California to figure out the best place to start eradication. We ranked the variables. The most important for us were distance from bodies of water with bullfrogs, refuse migration sites, and areas of the body of water. And this agreed with some of the comments. Cool. It's nice to, to have that confirmed. Uh, yeah, Annie, if you have uh, experience with this that would you know, change our direction at all. It, you know, we really appreciate your thoughts on that. Um, 
And, and Bradford, you, you mentioned the five mile circle. Travis, uh, after the challenge of combining different data sets, is there any value or what is the likelihood this database can be edited through something like collector so neighboring land managers can input survey data from different sites off the William Train Tradistic, but within the same system? Hmm. That's a you know that's a thought. Yeah, you know once it's once it's in a a standard format, it's it it'd be easy to put in collector. Yeah, you know, certainly to as something that you could be updating over time. Yeah, it's just in a file geo database, so at that point, it's not that not that difficult. Uh, Bradford and Merced County, we would get. Uh, 200 plus larvae and floating minnow traps with no bait for giant garter snakes and where bullfrogs are numerous. I find minnow traps and fike nets are great for getting larvae and smaller frogs. Okay. Um, yeah, uh, Audrey and Susie, that sounds like that, that's something to you. Yeah, we've, we've used, um, We've used minnow traps in situations that we can't um, use a seine net in. Um, I don't remember what a fike net is, um, but but we have a lot of success getting um, tadpoles with with dragging seines across uh, a pond. And if it's a, a loading situation and a little bit harder for seines, then we've used minnow traps um, to get the tadpoles. Okay. Ah, multiple funnel net with a bag to open in the back. Okay. Thank you, Bradford. Great discussion, folks. We still have about 15 minutes if people have more. Feel free to also unmute and ask questions or comments as well. I think there was, I don't know if the question from Larissa Bailey was addressed about the correlation um, among metrics of the same type. Mm. Right. Thanks for yeah. catching that, Audrey. The question was, yeah, was there high correlation in ranks uh, for a site among metrics of the same type? Oh, thank you. Yeah. Um, good question. I, I would imagine, but I haven't, haven't actually looked at that exact correlation. Good idea. Thank you. Yeah, that help us decide if, if, if some of them don't need to be thrown into the, the mix. I mean, there's got to be some, right? Uh, they're they're pretty similar measures, and I, I would expect high correlation between the nearest site and the average of the three nearest sites. I'd also expect similar correlations uh, with uh, with through the hydrologic network. But yeah, I, don't I guess have numbers. Yeah, the reason for my question goes back to the to the model weighting, right? So even right. though you gave equal weight to all 10 metrics, if there's high correlation among you those so metrics wrong. that are measuring isolation from bullfrog site, it actually gets 50% of your weight. So you're actually mm -hmm. inadvertently weighting that higher than say your distance to private land. Yep, that's a very good point. And I, I agree totally. And like I said, this was kind of a first shot at it and uh, we're, we're even going to be doing more data. So I, I think that is something that we will consider. Yeah, super interesting. And that, that part is easy to adjust, like you said. Yeah. So. <laughs> I did want to mention, you know, thanks again to all the people who contributed data. And I see that Roger Juice is on the on the talk right now. So thank you, especially for all that uh, data you contributed, Roger. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> Good to hear what it's moving forward, doing something. It's been <laughs> done. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs>
Are there any other questions for Jeff or the, the Bullfrog crew? <laughs> All right. Well, this is this has been really great. Um, and yeah, kudos on all this work that you all are doing. Um, I'm really excited to see where it goes. Um, so thank you everyone for taking the time to join us today. Like we said, this webinar was recorded. It'll be on our YouTube channel um, probably by the end of the day today, if not tomorrow at the latest. Um, we encourage you to visit CCAST um, and our case study dashboard where we currently have 166 case studies. A good handful of these are on bullfrogs, so feel free to um, surf through those if that's something you're interested in. Our next webinar is going to be on October 25th. This one is from Matt Gray of the University of Tennessee. Um, he will be speaking about the amphibian pet trade in the U.S. So if you're not already on our um, CCAST mailing list and you want to receive these announcements, um, just shoot me an email or Matt Gray by an email, we can get you on there. So thank you again for your time and especially to you, Jeff um, and Audrey and Susie and Olivia for answering the questions and doing this presentation. Um, and yeah, thank you so much and we hope to see you all again soon.